بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين كفروا وصدوا عن سبيل الله أضل أعمالهم والذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وآمنوا بما نزل على محمد وآمنوا بما نزل على محمد وهو الحق من ربهم كفر عنهم كفر عنهم سيئاتهم وأصلح بالهم ذلك بأن الذين كفروا اتبعوا الباطل الباطل وأن الذين آمنوا اتبعوا الحق من ربهم كذلك يضرب الله للناس أمثالهم وإذا لقيتم الذين كفروا فضرب الرقاب حتى حتى إذا أثخنتهم فشدوا الوثاق بهم ما من من بعض وإما في الداء في الداء حتى تضع الحرب أو زارها ذلك ولو يشاء الله لا تصر منهم ولكن ليبلو بعضكم ولكن ليبلو بعضكم ببعض والذين قتلوا في سبيل الله فلن يضل أعمالهم سيهديهم ويصلح بالهم ويدخلهم الجنة عرفها لهم يا أيها الذين آمنوا أقدامكم والذين كفروا فتعسلهم وأضل 
ما لهم ذلك بأنهم كرهوا ما أنزل الله فأحبط أعمالهم أفلم يسيروا في الأرض فينظروا كيف كان عاقبة الذين من قبلهم دمر الله عليهم وللكافرين أمثالها صنق الله العلي العظيم محمد صلوات خون حسین چادر زینب کی داستا خون حسین چادر زینب کی داستا کاپی زمین سن کے جسے روئے آسمان روئے آسمان خون حسین چادر زینب کی داستا یا مصطفیٰ ردائے بی امت نے چھین لی یا مصطفیٰ ردائے بی امت نے چھین لی اب جا کے سر چھپائے تیری بیٹیاں کہاں بیٹیاں کہاں خون حسین چادر زینب کی داستان وحشت سے قتل گا میں چونکے گا رات بر وحشت سے قتل گا میں چونکے گا رات بر اصغر کو جنگلوں میں پکارے گی ماں کہاں پکارے گی ماں کہاں خون حسین چادر زینب کی داستان زینب کے بازوں میں رسن کیا اندھیر ہے زینب کے بازوں میں رسن کیا اندھیر ہے با وفا علی اکبر جوان کہاں 
اکبر جواں کہا خون حسین چادر زینب کی داستان باد حسین سو سکینا نے چین سے باد حسین سو یہ سکینا نے چین سے شمر کی وہ جد کیا کہاں وہ جد کیا کہاں خون حسین چادر زینب کی داستان زہرا کے لاڈلے کے گلے پر چھوڑی چلی زہرا کے لاڈلے کے گلے پر چھوڑی چلی زینب کے بازوں میں بندی ریسمہ کہاں ریسمہ کہاں خون حسین چادر زینب کی داستان کہاں پہ زمین سن کے جسے روئے آسمان روئے آسمان خون حسین چادر سینب کی داستان محمد وعال محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم Be it the tips of our fingers or galaxies in the skies. Be it the tips of our fingers or galaxies in the skies. Beasts wandering the jungle or worshipping him, the flies, when it came to this world, spoke out the Lord great. When it came to this world, spoke out the Lord great. This world for Muhammad Allah creates. In his defense, the owner of Dhul Fiqar struck. In his defense, the owner of Dhul Fiqar struck. By him, the Lion of God stood. As others flocked, they all waited to be chosen, but stood or struck as he called for Ali and the universe rocked. For him, Ali rode out. For him Ali rode out and Khaybar's door plucked. For his love Ali in Muhammad's bed slept. Ali can't help but come first. Ali can't help but come first. But even he understood like shadows the sun, the moon. Ali follows Muhammad. His existence is for Muhammad since his birth date. This world for Muhammad Allah creates. A young girl steps into the crowd and they embrace. 
A young girl steps into the crowd and they embrace the blood she would wipe from her father's wounded face. From day one they hated him. From day one they hated him and they tried to disgrace. But her presence soothed him and he'd rise from his place defending against a tyrant alone her case. Defending against a tyrant alone her case and with such grace every injustice she'd erase Questioning his lineage, they'd insult her pure father. Questioning his lineage, they'd insult her pure father. And God silenced them with one verse. Indeed, we've sent to you, Kothar. She's the mistress of all women. She's the mistress of all women. And this was the fate this world for Muhammad Allah creates. Hussein boards his ship, this scene creating. Hussein boards his ship, this scene creating, behind him the 72 following, the water calms and the ark stops shaking as they enter salvation, a man for them is waiting. Every one of them stops. Every one of them stops and towards him they're facing. For him, around Hussein, they've been rotating. He stands and silenced is every sound. He stands and silenced is every sound. The reason for love and hate has been found. The reason to sacrifice, they couldn't wait. This world for Muhammad, Allah creates. In a world littered with murder and terror, he teaches us to love the rich and the beggar. Love those who he loves. Love those who he loves and love them for his pleasure. What is this religion? But loving those nearer and those who lied to him and fell into error, who rose to murder God's chosen messenger, it matters not who you are. It matters not who you are, a wife, a friend or a brother, your titles cannot save you, your actions were made clear. Don't be shy for his killers, the universe hates. Don't be shy for his killers, the universe hates. This world for Muhammad Allah creates, for one being God created everything. For one being God created everything, how then can anyone refrain from loving? But just in case, it's as if he was reminding man and jinn tightly onto Muhammad's rope. Cling, love is the first part. Love is the first part. Muhammad and his offspring, but it's only complete by his enemies hating. All we want is truth. All we want is truth when we question how he died. Quran tells us to question those who lived with him and lied. You tried to hide it. You tried to hide it, but the world saw your hate. This world for Muhammad Allah creates. You took the title mother of the believers. You took the title mother of the believers, never have I seen such a devious creature. To lie to him, to hurt him, you were so eager until Allah had to expose your every feature. When against Ali you rode out an army's leader, when against Ali you rode out an army's leader, did you think you could defeat the true believer? We have already told you, there's only one mistress. We've already told you, there's only one mistress. What you did to her father, the universe is a witness. Only he knows of your punishment, the weight. This world for Muhammad, Allah creates. As he'd walk past, trees would yearn to bow to his feet. As he'd walk past, trees would yearn to bow to his feet for a glimpse of his face. The angels would compete. He'd split it and the moon in happiness would weep. Christians would enter his mosque and get the best seat. The Jews waited for him. Their religion, he'd complete. The Jews waited for him. Their religion, he'd complete. And every atom his scent touched, Muhammad would greet, be it the tips of our fingers or the galaxies and the skies, beasts wandering the jungle, or worshipping him the flies. From his footsteps, the earth would ask permission to rotate. From his footsteps, the earth would ask permission to rotate. This world for Muhammad, Allah creates. Salallahu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.
الفرج الفرج ما شاء الله ما شاء الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم brothers and sisters as we are aware membership is now due for renewal please inquire to the desk um, also we only have a couple of more weeks before the grace period expires um, so those of you who have not renewed their membership please do so as previously announced the latest version of the diary of events will be the last copy that will be sent by post if you would prefer the diary of events in any other format please let us know at the earliest possibility and we will cater for your request tomorrow night the shahadat night of our eighth imam imam ali ibn musa radha for ladies and gents we'll begin at 7:30 p.m. with maghribain namaz niyaz followed by the main program the majlis will be recited by sayyid mahdi al mudarisi on thursday the 1st of december jumarat program for ladies and gents will begin at 7:45 p.m. with maghribain namaz dua kumail quran recitation marcia english uh, english majlis by maulana kalbe sadik matam ending with ziyarat warith on saturday the 3rd of december shahadat of bibi masuma iqum alayha salam اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعجل فرجه for ladies and gents we we'll begin at 7 pm with maghribain namaz quran recitation marcia majlis by sayyid mahdi al mudarisi and matam by nawha khan ali safdar ending with ziyarat at approximately 9:30 pm there will be a special question and answer session for ladies and gents with sayyid mahdi al mudarisi On Sunday the 4th of December Majlis Azza at Brother Sitain's residence will be held at 4 p.m. The majlis will be recited uh, by Sayyid Mahdi Mudarisi uh, after which there will be matam and ziyarat and niyaz will be served. His address can be found at the notice board outside. Brothers and sisters as we are aware the jamaat incurs additional costs during these holy nights and as such we request each and every individual family members to donate a minimum of 50 pounds towards the general fund. and also the niyas fund as much as possible hey we have teamed up with doctors from the muslim student council and the resuscitation council uk to provide basic life support training uh, which is a course which is accredited and of uh, and of no cost to yourself uh, those of you who would wish to participate please sign your names up at the desk um, and the ladies desk uh, for the ladies um, brothers and sisters Dua Shafa is requested for the following Marid Ayaz Bayramji, Tahira Bibi of Karachi, Mehdi Ali Hussain, Hassan Ali Kiswani, Zahra Jafar, Ali Hussain Molidina, Sher Muhammad Fazer Ali Molu and a brother who is critically unwell tonight. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amma yujibu al-mutarr idha da'ahu wa yakshifu as-su'. Amma yujibu al-mutarr idha da'ahu wa yakshifu as-su'. Amma yujibu al-mutarr idha da'ahu wa yakshifu as-su'. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Brothers and sisters, Surah Fatiha is requested for all the marhumin whose names will be appearing on the screens and their deceased family members رحم الله من يقرأ سورة الفاتحة بسم الله I would now like to invite Sayyid Mahdi Al Mudarisi to um, come up today to deliver tonight's lecture. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Could I request all the brothers to move as far forward as possible? Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. There's many spaces of room. أعوذ 
اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى آل بيتك المظلومين الغر الميامين روحي وأرواح العالمين لك الفداء يا حبيب رب العالمين اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين. To receive the intercession of the Holy Messenger of Allah, the Prophet of Mercy, Rasulullah Muhammad, on the Day of Judgment, recite aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. To console the master, the imam of our time, the awaited savior, whose heart is bleeding on this night, recite another loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. To ask Allah to hasten the reappearance of the imam, the Avenger, the Restorer of Justice, recite another loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Much has been said about the unmatched qualities, the unparalleled features of the Holy Messenger of Allah. The, mer the myriad of reasons that made this individual the greatest influencer of all time. Much has been said, much has been written, and while without a doubt all of that has been said and written is less than a drop in the ocean that is Rasulullah and will never be able to do justice to the grandeur of this great personality, the very reason for the creation of the heavens and the earth, there is still one quality that is perhaps neglected for one reason or another 
this topic, this subject, isn't touched upon sufficiently. And of course, I am more than aware of the sensibilities, the sensitivities involved in this particular discussion. But if there is any time that merits this discussion to be brought forward, it would be this time. It would be tonight. And I will use discretion. Not because I am afraid for my life, but because the use of discretion in this specific topic is a part of our religion. Because preserving the secrets of the Ahlul Bayt is a principle by which we must live and even die if we must. To protect the sanctity of the secrets of the Imams is something for which scholars have given the most precious of all things in order to do, and that is their blood, their heart, their lives. So I will use discretion. But at the same time, I am aware of many well-meaning, well-intentioned lovers of Rasulullah, followers of the Ahlul Bayt, who could use a dose or two of solid information when it comes to this matter. This topic, in short, is the oppression to which the Messenger of Allah was subjected to. On the eve where we commemorate the tragic passing of the Messenger of Allah, it's only appropriate, I'm sure you'd agree, for us to mourn the tragedy of the Messenger of Allah. For us to genuinely cry for the sake of the Messenger. And not to use the Prophet as an excuse or a stepping stone, but rather to really talk about the tragedies that he endured, the pains and miseries that he had to suffer from for the duration of his blessed life. Now, in order to do that, I'd like to ask you, while I will use discretion, I'd like you to keep an open mind. And I'd like you to examine the evidence. I'd like you to even set aside any hints or traces of prejudice, of quote-unquote conventional wisdom, things that you might have grown up believing, but really have no basis. Keep an open mind and see if the evidence measures up against the claims that are being made. Imagine you are the city coroner. They bring you a case. This case is especially important. It has a label at the very top of the file that says top priority. The reason for that is because number one, we're dealing with a, an incredibly high profile individual. We're dealing with the messenger of Islam, a religion that today has almost two billion adherents. So this makes it a very high profile case, this alone. Number two, the entire file reeks with foul play. And again, I'll try and present some of the evidence for this claim. But there is chatter about murder, that this person didn't die of natural causes, that indeed this is history's greatest cover-up. Now, of course, presenting this case to a coroner 
would at least merit an investigation, right? There are other reasons for that. Namely, the fact that this person was the subject of numerous assassination attempts. It's not the first time. If he was indeed killed, it certainly wasn't the first time that they tried to kill him. They tried to kill him when, remember the night of the Hijrah, when he was about to leave the holy city of Mecca, the city of his birth. They tried to assassinate him and was only saved by the fact that the commander of the faithful, the master of believers, Amir al muminin decided to put himself in harm's way and even sacrifice his life for the sake of the messengers, if it came down to that. That was one attempt. There were numerous other attempts along the way. And I'll talk about one specific attempt to highlight the gravity of the alleged crimes a little later, inshallah. So it wasn't the first time, if indeed this was an assassination. Secondly, there was a great deal of motive. That's the first thing that an investigator will look for. The first thing a coroner will ask about was their motive. Of course, there was. We're dealing with people who lived to fight and fought to live for centuries on end. We're dealing with warring tribes and factions that would go to battle for decades over a camel or a goat. We're dealing with people who are nothing short of savages. So, the individuals involved in the alleged plot, the high profile position of the victim, the fact that there are so many, this whole case is riddled with Suggestions of foul play and even, as I said, murder. Now, you take one quick look at this file and there is an endless barrage of questions that come storming through your mind. The first, of course, is, well, who did it? Right? And it's this specific question that I don't think I need to answer tonight. Hence my use of discretion. Who did it? Number two, how did they do it? What methods did they employ? Number three, when did it happen? Who were the culprits involved in the grander conspiracy? And so on and so forth. And these questions, brothers and sisters, one might be thinking right now, well, why even open a can of worms? Why even talk about this? while also using discretion, we understand that. But why discuss it? Well, first of all, because there is a supreme ideal. I'm sure you'll all, all agree with me. There is an ideal that should reign supreme above and beyond any other consideration. What is it? It's called the truth. So, irrespective of our own personal feelings, irrespective of sectarian or factional differences. This isn't about Shia or Sunni. This is about the prophet of this religion. This is about Rasulullah that we all love, that we all admire, that we all look up to. And so if the prophet was indeed the victim of such foul play, then I'm sure that regardless of your sectarian affiliation, you'd want to know. You'd want to know more. You'd want to know who's involved. You'd want to know their motives and why they did it. Because doing so will allow us to begin to answer many very difficult questions of our time. I'm amazed when they ask really senior scholars in the Wahhabi denomination, or religion, I should say. And they're asked some very simple questions, like, 
How do you explain people turning to terrorism, people become, joining ISIS, for instance? And their standard response is, well, there is no one single answer. We don't know. It's socioeconomic challenges. It has to do with oppression. It has to do with Western imperialism. It has to do... But ultimately, the whole idea is to murky the water. The idea is to make it a really confusing, difficult to understand kind of proposition, when in fact it's not. It's not that difficult. If you open your eyes, if you're willing to have a sense of justice for once, a sense of fairness, a sense of actually trying to understand the roots of the problem, it's really not that confusing. Because the problems that we see today, as is the case with any historical causality, what you see today is often very easily linked back to things that happened hundreds or even thousands of years ago. Now, why should we talk about this? Number one, because we're concerned about the truth, first and foremost. Secondly, because this will allow us to understand why when ISIS puts out a statement talking about their latest merciless barbaric attack against civilian targets, such as the one that took place two days ago in the city of Halla, where mostly female visitors of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. There were groups of women from Ahwaz, a place that they say is the target of suppression. They always talk about how the people of Ahwaz are oppressed by the Iranian regime and by this group or that group. Suddenly this oppressed people is murdered en masse for no other reason. None of them carried any weapons. None of, none of them was sporting any AK-47s. None of them was, was riding in armored personnel carriers. They had come from the shrine of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. And then when ISIS puts out a statement, there are two things that always stand out in those statements. Number one, their praise of the culprits, calling them brave soldiers of the Islamic State. You tell me, what is brave about strapping on an explosive vest and blowing yourself up in the midst of a bunch of women? What's so brave about that? If you're so brave, how about you go fight in broad daylight, out on the battlefield, like a man? So that's one thing that always stands out, the bravery of their, the so-called bravery of their soldiers. Number two, it's the fact that they, and again, I, chal I, ch I, I stand to be challenged on this. They never cite any prophetic action to justify their heinous crimes. It's never, we did this because the prophet did that. It's never the prophet. Who is it? It's the successors. It's the khulafa. It's the first, the second, the third. It's never the prophet. But isn't that interesting? You call yourselves Muslims, right? Shouldn't the prophet be your ultimate role model? Shouldn't the messenger of Allah be the one that you follow? What are you doing following this or that? So answering these questions will allow us to understand and be able to answer many more questions about the day, the world in which we live. Now, I stated that the Messenger of Allah was the target of numerous other attempts against his life. Before that, let me start with some very basic facts, universally accepted facts. Number one, the Messenger of Allah was murdered. Everybody agrees. Well, you might say, no, not everybody agrees because I've never heard that. At least as far as the vast majority of Muslims are concerned, the Prophet died of natural causes. And that's not true. Everybody agrees that the Messenger of Allah was murdered. So, not only do we all, and I'll explain, not only do we all agree 
that the messenger did not die of natural causes, but we also agree on the method with which he was killed, orally administered poison. So the Shia and the Sunni believe that the Prophet was murdered? The answer is yes. How so? Well, the only difference on the views held by various sects and denominations within Islam is the identity of the culprits. It's not so much who killed the Prophet, because everybody agrees that he was killed. By the way, when I say everybody, I'm talking about the most senior scholars here. If you see some random person on the street who disagrees with you, that's because they haven't read Sahih Bukhari. And that's because they haven't referred to their own references, to their own collections of hadith and their own history books like Ibn Kathir's and Ibn Hisham's and Ibn Sa'ad's and so on and so forth. So when it comes to that category of scholars, everybody's in agreement that the messenger of Allah was killed. The difference is they say that the prophet was killed by a Jewish woman. Her name is Zainab bin al Harith. Who's Zainab bin al Harith? You might remember her as the sister of Marhab ibn al Harith the great Jewish warrior who was the last man standing between Muslims and taking the palace of Khaybar. So, Marhab faces off with the commander of the faithful. The Imam famously slays him. And when the Jews saw that Marhab had died, when they realized that their last hope of survival and of protecting their fortress has now been eliminated by a single strike of the commander of the faithful, a man who identified himself as Haidara, they realized that there was no point in resisting. And so they easily surrendered to the army of Islam, the army of one, the army of Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Now, Marhab had a sister. His sister's name was Zainab bint al Harith. Al Bukhari mentions this hadith. So does Al Hakim and Naysaburi. And they quote Abu Huraira, although there are many other sources for this particular incident. Essentially, they say that Zainab bint al Harith decided to put poison in a sheep and cook the sheep and offer it to the messenger of Allah in retaliation for the murder of her brother Marhab. Now, Al-Bukhari's version is really interesting because it goes into detail. Essentially it says that Zainab placed that poison in the sheep, brought it, offered it to the Prophet and his companions. The Prophet then sat down he took a bite of that meat, chewed that first bite, didn't swallow it, he chewed it, and then he told his companions to immediately stop eating. The companions stopped eating. Then they said, Ya Rasulullah, what's going on? The Prophet said that this sheep, this meat, this food is poisoned. We shouldn't eat any of it. There was one other companion who was quick to eat a couple of bites before the Prophet had told them, the companions to stop, he ended up actually dying, right? So make note of that, we'll get back to it. Now, this Messenger of Allah says to everyone, stop eating, they all stop. Then he says, bring the Jews, bring Zainab bint al Harith. They all come. Again, this is according to Bukhari. The Prophet addresses the Jews and Zainab bint al Harith and said, let me ask you a question and I want you to respond truthfully and honestly. Will you do that? They all say yes. Ya Abu al-Qasim will respond truthfully. So the Prophet says, did you poison this sheep? So they said, yes, we did. He said, Wama hamalakum ala thalik. What made you do so? They responded by saying, listen carefully. They said, we thought to ourselves, if he is a prophet, then God will protect him. He won't 
فَلَا تَضُرُّهُ They said, if he's a prophet, God will inform him of the poisonous nature of the meat and it will not harm him. So it, it's a test of his prophethood. If he is a prophet, it won't bring him any harm. وَإِنْ كَانَ مَلِكًا But if he's just another king who's here in order to defeat us and to conquer our lands, استَرَحْنَا مِنْهُ وَأَرَحْنَا مِنْهُ النَّاسِ Then we will get rid of him and he will die like every other king. So, this test, this incident of poisoning the meat isn't just another incident where there is poison being placed in the meat and being offered to someone. This suddenly became and it was elevated to the status of challenging the prophethood of the Messenger of Allah. Am I right? So, to suggest that the Prophet ultimately died as a result of eating that meat, what does that mean? How does that reflect on the Prophet's truthfulness, on the Prophet's prophethood and mandate from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They'd already said, if he is a Prophet, it won't harm him. But it turns out, not only did it harm him, it killed him. It didn't do so immediately, but ultimately, that's what happened. And so, Aisha says, again in Sahih Bukhari, she says that when the Prophet was on the brink of his death, he told me that I can still taste the poison of that Jewish woman who fed me that meat in Khaybar. Again, this questions the legitimacy of the Prophet. Right? Secondly, for them to even say that the Messenger of Allah took a bite and chewed it, then told everyone to stop eating, that means that he was never told by God that this meat was poisonous. He tasted the poison. If God were to tell him that he shouldn't eat from this meat, you'd think that God would do so before he puts it in his mouth. And somehow, gets that poison into his system and ultimately gets him killed. So that is by far the biggest problem we have with this narrative. That it undermines the truthfulness of the Messenger of Allah. And that we shall never accept. Number one. Number two, what kind of poison is this? It's administered in the year seven after Hijrah and the Prophet dies four years later in the year 11 after Hijrah. What kind of poison would leave you living and leading a healthy, perfectly natural life for four years until you suddenly drop dead? It doesn't work that way. It, simp it simply defies logic. And so this narrative is rejected. But it's helpful in order to establish, as I said earlier, that it's a unanimously agreed upon proposition that the Messenger of Allah was killed. The only question is, what, was it Zainab bin al Harith, the Jewish woman who challenged the Prophet's prophethood, or was it someone else? Was it someone else? Now, let me add just another piece of the puzzle that the coroner is presented with when this case is brought to him. And that is that the Qur'an actually predicted the Prophet would be assassinated. Where? Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 144. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and I'd like you to pay close attention here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ صَلُّوا عَلَى مُحَمَّدٌ وَعَلَى مُحَمَّدٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُلُ 
أفإما تأنقتلا قلبتم على أعقابكم ومن ينقلب على عقبيه فلن يضر الله شيئا والله يجزي الشاكرين Take this verse, look it up in any standard translation. It'll say the following. It says that the messenger is but another prophet, an apostle from Allah. Other prophets have passed before him. They've come and they've gone. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes a radically different shift and says, أَفَإِنْ مَا تَأَوْقُتِلْ If he were to die, again, I'm quoting the standard translation of the Qur'an, if he were to die or be killed, then you would turn against, you would turn on your heels. And whoever does so will not harm God in the slightest fashion. And God shall reward those who are thankful. But there's a problem with this translation. It says, if the Prophet died or was killed, then you would turn around. In other words, you would become apostates. Why would God say, if he died or was killed? This or between death and murder, what's it exactly doing there? Is God not sure what's going to happen to the Prophet? Does God have any doubt as to the future events that will take place against one of the most important events, against the single most important figure in all of history? You'd think that God would speak with a little, with a little bit more certainty, right? Which is why this translation is erroneous. This translation is wrong. It's not if he died or he was killed, even though, again, those of you who speak a little bit of Arabic will know that أو أفإن مات أو قتل أو has two meanings. The first is when you're presented with two alternatives. This or that, right? It literally means or. But in this context, it can't possibly mean or because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should know whether it's natural death or murder. Someone comes to Imam al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamu He says to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I don't understand this verse. Why wouldn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speak with more certainty, with more clarity? Why does he say death by natural causes, that is, or murder? So the Imam responds, he says, the holy messenger of Allah was slain. He was poisoned to death. He never died of natural causes. How do we deduct that from the verse? Well, oh here doesn't mean or, it means indeed. It means if he died or indeed he was murdered, will you then turn around and become apostates? Is there another verse in the Qur'an which uses the word aw in a similar fashion? And the answer is yes. Go to Surah As-Safat, verse number 147. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about Prophet Yunus, the Noon, the one with the whale. And he says, وَأَرْسَلْنَاهُ إِلَىٰ مِئَةِ أَلْفٍ أَوْ يَزِيدُونَ we sent him to a hundred thousand of his own people, that is. We sent him to a hundred thousand. Aw yazidun. Aw means or more. So Allah is, is not certain. God doesn't know whether it was a hundred thousand or more than a hundred thousand. And so even the standard English translations of the Quran here will translate aw in a different way. They'll say, God says that we sent him to a hundred thousand. Rather, to a number that exceeded a hundred thousand. 
Indeed, it was more than a hundred thousand. So the Quran predicted the Prophet would be murdered. Add that to all the other pieces of the puzzle. Add that to the fact that we've already established the Prophet was killed. Whether that was four years ago in some concocted scenario where the Prophet is defeated against the challenge made to him by some Jewish woman, or the more plausible scenario would be the Prophet was killed by the hypocrites. Rasulullah was killed by the two gypsies. And I use the word gypsies not as a pejorative, if you like. It's a descriptive term. It's not pejorative. I'm not insulting gypsies here, though you'd be rightly thinking that this is an insult to every gypsy on the face of the planet. But we're talking about those Bedouins who had no sense of justice or fairness or faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their only aim and objective in life was power, wealth, money. And they stood at nothing when it came to acquiring those pleasures in this life. Even if it meant murdering the Messenger of Allah. May God's peace and blessings be upon him and upon his family. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Now, I also alluded to the fact that there were other assassination attempts against the Prophet. The most famous is one that is known as Hadithatul Aqaba. Essentially, the long story short, is that when the Prophet went to the Battle of Tabuk, as he was returning, and remember the Battle of Tabuk was the one which was to be waged against the Romans. And the commander of the faithful was appointed by the Messenger of Allah to look after the women and the children and the people of Medina. So the Prophet left the Imam. And there were hypocrites who tried to use that to discredit the commander of the faithful, who came up to him and said, look at you. Rasulullah has left you with a bunch of women and children instead of taking you with him to fight. It was the only battle that the Messenger of Allah did not accompany his sweetheart, his beloved brother, Ali ibn Abi Talib. And so the Imam came to the Prophet. He told him of the insults that were hurled against him. And it was at that occasion that the Prophet of Islam famously declared, Ya Ali, Anta minni bi manzilati Harun min Musa, illa annahu la nabiyya ba'di. You to me are like Harun was to Musa. What was Harun to Musa? He was a brother to Musa. He was an advisor to Musa. He was an assistant to Musa. He was everything that Musa was except that you are not a prophet while Harun was a prophet. And so it was in this battle, the only battle that Imam Ali did not participate in was the battle in which not a drop of blood was shed. Because if there had to be fighting, you know that Ali ibn Abi Talib had to be at the forefront of that battle. So the Prophet returns from Tabuk. On his way back, if I'm able to paint a picture of the terrain, I would say that there was a valley which took the long route back. However, there was a shortcut. And the shortcut involved the climbing of a cliff or a small mountain and then going through a very narrow pathway which was dangerous, it was risky. So the Prophet told other Muslims, the rest of the army, he said to them to take the long route. But he himself decided to take the shortcut. He had two people accompanying him on that shortcut. The first was Ammar ibn Yasir, the other was a companion known as Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman. Remember this name. Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman himself narrates the story. This hadith can be found in numerous Sunni as well as Shi'i 
reference books and collections of hadith. The one I am narrating now is in a book called Tarikh al-Islam by the most reliable Sunni historian named Al-Dhahabi. Al-Dhahabi is considered very reliable, particularly to the Ahnaf and the Wahhabi school of thought, right? So when it comes to Ibn Sa'd and others, they have their suspicions. But Al-Dhahabi was a true Nasibi. So you know that this person would be deemed reliable by Wahhabis and by Salafis. So this hadith is narrated by none other than the Habi. He says, and he quotes who? al hudayfa ibn Yaman. He says that I was holding the reins of the Prophet's mule. And I was walking, the Prophet was riding. And as we are walking, now, if you're walking and or riding on the very edge of the mountain, you have to be in control. You have to maintain balance. But even more difficult than that is for you, it's for you to maintain balance for your ride, whether it's a horse or a camel or a mule, because the slightest adjustment, the slightest problem could provoke the ride into panic, and that panic could lead you to fall all the way down into the valley and die. And so what had happened was, and there again, there are many, many traditions that describe this event in detail. The number of culprits and perpetrators involved ranges from 12 to 15, right? But the incident itself is mentioned with absolute certainty. There's no doubt about the incident itself and in principle. So Hudayfa says that I was walking with the Prophet. There was a group of people, 12 to 15 people as we said, who had conspired against the Messenger of Allah, seeing that Ali was not with the Prophet, presented them with a golden opportunity. What do we do? They thought to themselves, the easiest thing to do is to wait for the Prophet to get to this point where it's a very narrow edge, and for us to hurl a few rocks from the top. Because those rocks might not kill the Prophet, but at the very least, they could cause the mule or his ride to panic, and that panic could cause it to throw the Prophet down the valley and kill him, right? So the idea was to start a rock slide. Before they did that, and before they got to the point where they had the opportunity to put their plan into action, Jibra'il descends upon the Messenger of Allah. He exposes the conspiracy. He tells them exactly what's going to happen. And so the Prophet exposes their location. But the Prophet doesn't just avoid or go on a detour. Instead, he does the most genius thing you can think of. He tells Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman that look at those people hiding behind those rocks. They're trying to do one, two, three. When Hudayfa realized what was happening, he said, according to al dhahabi in Tariq al-Islam, he says that I began chasing after them. When they realized that their position had been compromised, they started running away and they escaped. So then the Prophet said to me, Hudayfa says, he said to me, Ya Hudayfa, did you recognize them? Hudayfa said, no, Ya Rasulullah, they were all wearing masks. I don't know who they were. So then the Prophet told me exactly who they are. He told me their names one by one. Now, Hudayfa says, I told the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, if they were trying to do what they were, and I have no doubt that they were, because you're the one telling me. And if you know who they are, and of course you know who they are, because you're told by God Himself, then why don't you retaliate? Why don't you do something about this? And he specifically offers one method of retaliation and punishment, which is perhaps the safest one of all. He says to him, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you tell their tribes and have their tribal chiefs deal with them? Have their tribes punish them? so you don't have to get your hands dirty, right? The tribes 
when you tell them, when the Messenger of God conveys to them what their people were trying, were conspiring to do, they will have their heads and they will be more than honored to present their heads to you. And it'll be the end of this conspiracy, this very dangerous moment in the history of Islam. What does the Prophet say? The Prophet says, no, I don't want to do that. Why? Again, listen carefully. He says, I would hate for people to then say that this messenger used these companions. These companions helped this Prophet achieve success only to then turn against them and kill them. Now the Prophet was well within his right to retaliate, to inflict the most serious of all punishment. Right now in the most civilized countries in the Western world, merely threatening to assassinate the president or a senior statesman is a crime in itself. Imagine if you actually participated, if you actually attempted to kill the president. These people attempted to do so. So the prophet would have been well in his right to inflict that sort of punishment on them, to have them all executed. But he says, I don't want to do that for two reasons. Number one, because the Prophet was sent as a mercy to mankind. This messenger of Allah wasn't sent to be a vindictive, bloodthirsty killer, even when it came to the worst of God's creatures, to the ones who were trying to shed his innocent blood and to do so in the most cowardly way. Reason number one. Reason number two, think about the wording of the Prophet's statement. Essentially, he's saying that these people helped me be where I am today. Do you know why that's significant? Because one of the reasons used to justify the theory that all companions are just and all companions are righteous is what? They say, well, these people had a track record of contributing to Islam. These people helped the Prophet in war, in battle, in Uhud, in Khaybar, here, there. And they'll start listing all their actions in Islam. The Prophet is putting his hand right on this argument. He says, look, I know they contributed. Well, seemingly contributed. I know they were part of Islam. So don't give me this excuse that, oh, they did this and they did that because they were always hypocrites from beginning to end. No one who contributes anything to Islam and then attempts to kill the Prophet of Islam. So don't give me this pathetic excuse that all oh, these were companions and they were with the Prophet from day one or day two. It really doesn't matter. This is irrelevant. Their CVs are irrelevant. What is relevant is how they conducted themselves during the Prophet's lifetime as well as after the Prophet's lifetime. After the Prophet, did they stay true to the Messenger of Islam? Did they remain loyal to the Prophet and his family? Did they fulfill their promises that were made to the Messenger of Allah about honoring his kindred and progeny or not? If the answer is no, they can take all their previous actions and their track record with them directly into the bottomless pit of hell. Because the one who ends up winning isn't the one who sprints at the beginning of the race. It's how you end up. It's what you do towards the finishing line. Right? If you become a kafir, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in that same verse, Al-Imran 144, أَفَإِنْ مَا تَأَوْقُتِلْ إِنْ قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ You turn on your back. You abandon the principles and values of this religion just because the Prophet's gone. Just because he's been murdered. Now, the fact that the Prophet told Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman was the most ingenious move in itself. Why? Because Hudayfa today is known as the person who held secrets about the hypocrites among Muslims. 
Sunni scholars say that Hudayfa kana ya'lamu asma' al-munafiqeen. Hudayfa knew all the hypocrites. Well, there's a specific group of hypocrites that he knew. And they were the ones who took part in the assassination of Aqaba, this particular incident that I talked about. Now, why would the Prophet tell Hudayfa the names and then ask him not to reveal the names to anyone? It's one thing not to kill the hypocrites, not to go and punish them for what they try to do. But to tell the Hudayfa not to inform anyone, why would the Prophet do that? This is the most ingenious move ever. Because by letting the hypocrites know that there is someone who knows who they are, what you're doing essentially is that you're smoking them out. You're making them come forward. If there was no Hudayfa, if the only person who knew the hypocrites was the Prophet himself, you, you would get rid of all the evidence by killing the Prophet. But now that you have the Prophet who knows, obviously, then does Hudayfa and also Ammar, this complicates the situation. You got too many witnesses to deal with, right? You can't go around killing everyone because that'll only make you worse. It'll, it'll make you look much worse, much more criminal than you already are. And so what do you do? You feel safe on the one hand that Hudayfa has been instructed not to tell anyone the identity of the culprits. But on the other hand, you're always afraid that what if Hudayfa is a loose cannon? What if Hudayfa says something? And indeed, Hudayfa did do something to expose the identity of those hypocrites. What did he do? They say that whenever one of the companions died, the other companions would look at Hudayfa and they'd wait to see whether he prayed upon the deceased. If he prayed upon him, then he's a good person. If he refused to pray, then that makes him among the hypocrites. So one day, during the reign of the second gypsy, Hudayfa is sitting in the mosque, teaching, reciting narrations. They bring a deceased companion. They put the body right there. So the gypsy stands up and he says, well, we have one of the Muslims who has just died. Let's go and participate in his funeral. So he walks in his funeral when Hudayfa walks up to him and he says to him, listen, this person was one of them. Be careful. I wouldn't pray behind him. I wouldn't participate in the funeral. What does he say in response to Hudayfa? Talk about smoking them out. He says to Hudayfa, Unshiduka billah. Let me ask you in the name of God, am I one of them too? <laughs> now why would you ask that question? If you're innocent, if you had nothing to do with it, why would you even ask that question? Why would you make yourself look like not just a fool, but a criminal in the, in the first degree, in the worst possible manner? I ask you, do you also deal with my file? Did the Prophet reveal my name to you as well? Again, these are hints. These are suggestions. These are signposts. These are pieces of the puzzle. The smart person would be the one to set aside prejudices. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. Start to put the pieces together and see what it looks like in the end. There is one more evidence as to the events that led up to the tragic martyrdom of Rasulullah. Ibn Mas'ud says, and this is in Mustadrak al Hakib lin Naysaburi. Ibn Mas'ud says, Lain ahlifa billahi tis'an ala anna Rasulullah qutil ahabu ilayya min an ahlifa lillahi wahida. He says, for me to swear in the name of God nine times that the Prophet was in fact murdered is a lot easier than for me to swear just once that
that he died of natural causes. In fact, Ibn Hisham says in his seerah, he says that everybody knows the Prophet was martyred. لِأَنَّ اللَّهُ بَعَثَهُ نَبِيًّا وَاشْتَبَاهُ شَهِيدًا There was a time when there was no dispute. The dispute only exists in this day and age. Not just because there are people who deny the fact, but because we have even, even people on our side who for some reason that is beyond my comprehension try to whitewash history and try to cover up this greatest crime that history had ever witnessed. This, brothers and sisters, is indeed history's greatest cover-up. And it is one more manifestation that the Messenger of Allah is indeed oppressed. That the Prophet would die a martyr and we would still refer to it as a passing, as his death, as his demise, when in fact it's nothing but martyrdom. Imam al Hassan, and this, brothers and sisters, by the way, is the most important, most compelling evidence that we, the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, have that the Prophet was martyred. What is it? The Imams themselves said it over and over again. Imam al Hassan told some of his family members and his companions, Inni uqtalu masmuman kajaddi Rasulullah. I shall be poisoned to death much like my grandfather, the Messenger of Allah. They said to him, how will you be poisoned to death? Who will do that to you? He said, Zawjati ju'datu bintul ash'ath. It'll be at the hand of my own wife. Look at the similarities. Look at the resemblance. Look at how history repeats itself. One more evidence and I'll wrap up. Bukhari mentions this hadith. It says, Quotes Aisha. Aisha says that when the Prophet was on his deathbed, he was very ill, he was sick. Incidentally, there are many dis discrepancies and there are many contradictions in the words of Aisha herself as to what led to the Prophet's death. In certain narrations, she says that Abbas, the Prophet's uncle, administered something and put something in his mouth that ultimately led to his death. In other narrations, she says that the Prophet was afflicted with a demonic disease. Demonic, as in the demons killed the Prophet. In other traditions, and this one in particular, she says that the Prophet became very sick. We didn't know exactly what the sickness was. It had to do with his kidney, or it had to do with his liver. She says, we don't know. However, when he was on his bed, lying unconscious, we came and put something in his mouth. Now, she justifies this by saying that what we put in his mouth was a, some kind of uh, cure, right? It was medicine, which is also very bitter. But what's interesting is how the Prophet reacted. She says, as I was approaching him to put that medicine in his mouth, Ashara ilay. He told me not to put that in my mouth. He repeatedly said, do not come forward. Imagine Rasulullah is telling you don't do something and you go ahead and do it anyway. How do you explain that? So she says, obviously there were other people watching this and she justified her actions by saying, oh, he's only sick and no sick person wants to eat any bitter medicine. But medicine is bitter and he has to take it. Rasulullah kept saying no, but I put that in his mouth anyway. Then, she says when the Prophet woke up, regained his strength, he says he saw signs of something being placed in his mouth, on his clothes, on his mouth. So then he said, what did you do? What did you just put in my mouth? So we told him that, oh, Abbas put something in your mouth. The Prophet said, no, Abbas had nothing to do with this. What did you put in my mouth? They said, well, it was medicine. He said, I told you not to put it in my mouth. They said, but we thought you're a sick person and no sick person wants to eat any bitter medicine. So we put it in there anyway. So then the Prophet, again, according to Sahih Bukhari, 
the Prophet said, then you shall take that same mysterious substance and put it in your mouth as well, in punishment. Now why would the Prophet do this if this was only medicine? The Prophet isn't some vindictive monster. He's not some child. You put bitter medicine in my mouth, I'll put it in your mouth. Why would the Prophet say this? Of course that never transpired. They never ended up putting that substance in their mouth. But the Prophet said you should put it in your mouth, but not that of Abbas because Abbas was not here. So falsely claiming that it was Abbas will not be sufficient here. Allahu Akbar. All these pieces of the puzzle and there's still doubt? Some mysterious substance being put in the Prophet's mouth against his will? Towards the end of his life, just before his life deteriorated? And there's still some doubt? But again, to us brothers and sisters, the most compelling evidence is what the Ahlul Bayt have said. And the Ahlul Bayt have said that the greatest calamity was that of Rasulullah. Imam Sadiq quotes the Messenger of Allah as having said that whoever is afflicted with a tragedy should compare his tragedy with mine for my tragedy is the greatest of all tragedies. Ya Rasulullah, they insulted you for your entire life as a messenger. They left no accusation except that which was leveled against you. They hurt you so much to the point that you declared, ma nabiyun bimithli ma No prophet, no apostle has been hurt as much as I have been hurt. Allahu Akbar. And now, after all that you have done for them, after all the efforts, after all the struggles, this is how they repay you, Ya Rasulullah. By poisoning you to death. Sallallahu alayka ya Mawla. Ya Rasul Allah. Ya Aba Zahra. Fatima Zahra is about to be orphaned, Ya Mu'mineen. Ali ibn Abi Talib's loneliness is about to begin. A loneliness that will last a lifetime. Twenty years after this day, Ammar says to Amir al Mu'mineen, he says, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, when Rasulullah died, he only had seven strands of hair which were gray. But when I look at your beard, there is no black hair in it. Everyone say, Mazlum Ali, Mazlum Ali, Mazlum Ali, Mazlum. Ammar says, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, take this hair dye, place it on your beard so you don't look so old. Amir al Mu'mineen says, Ya Ammar, do you not know that I'm still in the state of mourning, Rasulullah? Twenty years after this day, Ali is still mourning. He's still crying. 
Everything that happened, happened after this day. All the calamities, all the tragedies. Which is why Ibn Abbas was seen crying. Ibn Abbas, what is wrong with you? He says, I am mourning the calamity of the miserable Thursday. I don't know which of the Prophet's tragedies we should talk about tonight. Is it the tragedy that Rasulullah asked them for a pen and paper to leave a will? And they said that the Prophet is delirious. <laughs> they said unashamedly, the man is delirious. <laughs> he cried out with no shame. The Quran is sufficient. We don't need the messenger. Let him die. Allahu Akbar, is that the tragedy we should talk about? Is it the fact that he was born? Poison to death. Ah, hadith says that towards the end of his life, Rasulullah gathered his family, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Fatima al-Zahra, al-Hasan, al Hussein, took them inside a room, then he closed the door. He then said to everyone, Jibra'il is with us inside this room right now, and he has a question from Allah. The question is, will you be able to be patient after I die? Atasbiruna ba'da mawti. Will you be patient or not? So they all responded together in unison. They said, if that is what Allah wants, then we will be patient. فَبَكَى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ The Prophet then burst into tears. وَبَكَى عَلِي وَبَكَتْ فَاطِمَ وَبَكَ الْحَسَنْ وَالْحُسِينَ their cries were then heard from outside the room. Why would they cry? Because Rasulullah knew exactly what patient ma patience meant. Rasulullah could see as the armies marched towards his daughter's house, Fatima to Zahra. Because Rasulullah could see what his grateful nation was going to do to his family, to his grieving offspring. Allahu Akbar! Rasulullah is now on his deathbed. Where? He's in the house of his daughter Fatima, the house of Amir al Mu'mineen. As the Prophet is on his deathbed, someone comes knocking at the door. Fatima to Zahra goes to the door. Who is it? He says, Ana Gharib. I'm a stranger. Can I come and see the Prophet? Fatima says, My father's too sick to see anyone. Go back where you came from. She goes back to her father's bedside. Another knock is made at the door. Who is it? Ana Gharib. I'm that same stranger. I want to see the Prophet. Fatima to Zahra once again asks him to leave them. My father's too sick. When he knocks at the door the third time, Rasulullah says, Bunayya Fatima. Do you know who this stranger is? This is the same stranger, Hadimul Ladhat, Mufarriqul Jama'at. This is the one who brings all happiness to an end. This is my brother Israel. And let me tell you one more thing, O oh Fatima. I don't know if you, my brothers and sisters, have the capacity to make the connections. He said to her, Fatima, you know this brother of mine, he's only knocked at one door in his life, and he will never knock at another door. In other words, he's asked for permission to come into your home, and he never asks for permission yet again. This is Israel, go and open the door for him. Ya Rasulallah!
Even Azrael asks for permission. Where were you, O Messenger of God? Ya Rasul Allah, when Fatima called out your name, Fatima to Zahra opens the door. Azrael enters. He says, Ya Rasul Allah, I am here. I am not imposing anything. Allah has sent me to ask you for your permission because God is eager to meet with you. Will you surrender your soul to me, O Messenger of God? Rasulullah says to him, Wait, I am waiting for my brother Jibra'il. Why would the Prophet say this? It'll all become clear. I'm waiting for Jibra'il. Wait. Jibra'il descends a few moments later. Rasulullah says to him, Jibra'il, what do you say? Should I surrender my soul? Jibra'il says, Ya Rasulullah, paradise is now ready to receive you. The angels are anticipating your return. Yes, do accept his offer. Rasulullah says, no, it's not time yet. Jibra'il ascends back to the heavens. He comes back this time with an offer he knows Rasulullah will not refuse. Do you know what the Prophet was waiting for? Habibi, Ya Rasulullah. He says to him, God says to you that if it's going to get you to accept then we are willing to offer you shafa'a for your nation, Ya Rasulullah. وَلَسَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى Now I accept to surrender my soul. If it means I can help my followers, the lovers of Rasulullah, the lovers of Ali ibn Abi Talib, then I accept, O Jibra'il. Then Israel began extracting the soul of Rasulullah. Ya Mu'mineen, ajarakum Allah. He began extracting the soul. Rasulullah then said, O oh Israel, is this how you extract the soul of my nation, of other Muslims? Azrael said, No, Ya Rasul Allah, I am being very gentle with you. I have special instructions from Allah. You are the beloved sweetheart. Of course, it's not the same. <coughs> So Rasulullah said to him, he said, Ya Azrael, shaddid alay wa khafif ala ummati. Let me try and translate this for you. According to one of our ulama, he says what the Prophet was saying was this, O oh Azrael, take the roughness of the extraction of their souls of all Muslims. Take it all, put it together and put it on me me so that when you take their souls they don't have to suffer <laughs> Shaddid alay wa khaffif ala ummati. Rasulullah is being so kind and gentle to his nation. Was the, gen was the nation grateful? Of course they were. Of course, you know, the Prophet has famously said that when a laborer does a service to you, then you should reward him, you should compensate him even before the sweat on his forehead dries. So this nation, Ya Mu'mineen, rewarded their messenger even before the drops of water from his ghusl al-mayyit was dry. How did they reward Rasulullah? Let me paint you a picture. 300 people surrounding the house of Fatima to Zahra. 45 days later, 300 men standing outside, threatening to ambush the house of Fatima. What else? There is smoke coming out of the house. The dress of Fatima to Zahra has caught fire. Muhsin, the child, the unborn son of Ali, that was named by Rasulullah.
Rasulullah is lying dead between the wall and the door. This is how they rewarded Rasulullah. Allahu Akbar. The hadith says Imam Hassan and Hussein came. They threw themselves onto the Prophet's chest. Amir al muminin wanted to remove them. Rasulullah said, Ya Ali, leave them. Leave my beloved Hassan and Hussein on my chest. Their weight will make this moment of my death easier for me. But it was only Allahu Akbar Ajarakumullah. It was only 45 days later that Hassan and Hussein found themselves on the chest of their mother Fatima to Zahra. Hassan crying out, Oh mother, send our salam to our grandfather. Hussein saying, Oh mother, we've just been afflicted by Rasulullah. Why do this to us? Then the call was made. Imam al Baqir says this. He says, A voice was heard in the heavens. Ya Ali, what are you doing? Take them off of their mother's chest. Because the universe is spinning out of control. The angels are crying in the heavens. Ahmil Huma ya Abel Hassan. Fa'inna Huma abke ya malaikata sama. Now, why would, why would the Imam have to remove the children from their mother's chest but not their grandfather? I don't know. But maybe one of the reasons was that the ribs of Fatima to Zahra. I was a hero. Wa mazlumata. Wa fatimata. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein. سر کلے جبریل ہے ہو گیا محشر بپا آتا ہے تابوت یہ پیٹتی ہے فاطمہ روتے ہیں مشکل خوشا جبریل کا ہے سر کھلا آتا ہے تا بوت یہ کرتے ہیں حسنین بکا دیتے ہیں رو رو صدا جاتے ہیں نانا کہاں آتا ہے تا بوت یہ سایہ 
नबी का उठा करती है उम्मत बुका हाए रसूल खुदा आहता है तूत ये कहते हैं अहले वतन हाय रसूले जमन चल बसे सुए जिना आता है तोत ये खत में रसूलान का आता है तोत ये दीन के सुलतान का आता है तोत ये चली है मां हक फात मां रसूल के बाद चली है मां हक फात मां रसूल के बाद सीतम की हो गई त्यौहार सोल के बाद सीतम की हो गई त्यौहार सोल के बाद सीतम की हो गई त्यौहार सोल के बाद सीतम की हो गई त्यौहार के बाद मिल के परिये सीतम की हो गई इन बा सीतम की हो गई इन त्यौहार सोल के बाद सीतम की हो के बाद रसूल साद करी क्यों रही सरे दरबार रसूल साद करी क्यों रही सरे दरबार ये कौन तक पे बैठा रहा रसूल के बाद सीतम की हो गई इन हार सोल के बाद सीतम की हो गई सीतम की हो गई इन त्यौहार सोल वो जाके शहर से बाहर पिदर को रोती रही वो जाके शहर से बाहर पिदर को रोती रही किसी ने गर में न रोने दिया रसूल के बाद सीतम की हो गई इन त्यौहार सूल के बाद सीतम की हो हार सोल के बाद सीतम की हो गई
کے بعد وہ جرم کیا تھا کہ جس پر علی کو گلیوں میں وہ جرم کیا تھا کہ جس پر علی کو گلیوں میں رسن سے باندھ کے کھینچا گیا رسول کے بعد ستم کی ہو گئی یہ ان کہا رسول کے بعد ستم کی ہو کہا رسول شکست ہو گیا کیسے بطول کا پہلو شکست ہو گیا کیسے بطول کا پہلو بتاؤ ظلم یہ کس نے کیا رسول کے بعد ستم کی ہو گئی یہ ان تیہا رسول کے بعد ستم کی ہو گئی یہ ان تیہا رسول شہید ہو گیا اس کی زیب سے محسن شہید ہو گیا اس کی زیب سے محسن در بطو لگرایا گیا رسول کے بعد ستم کی ہو گئی یہ ان تیہا رسول کے بعد ستم کی ہو گئی یہ ان تیہا رسول کے بعد فاطمہ فاطمہ زہرا فاطمہ زہرا فاطمہ زہرا فاطمہ زہرا یا زہرا یا زہرا یا زہرا یا زہرا یا زہرا یا زہرا اے میری بی بی اے میری بی بی تیرے در پہ استغاثہ ہے تیرا ممنون میری شہزادی یہ جہاں سارا ہے یا زہرا یا زہرا یا زہرا یا زہرا فرش مجلس پہ اور مسلح پر فرش مجلس پہ اور مسلح پر ہر جواں کہہ رہا ہے رو رو کر ہر جواں کہہ رہا ہے رو رو کر ہم رہے نہ رہے مگر بی بی تا قیامت رہے غمِ سرور یا زہرا 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 یا 
یا زہرا تجھ کو مت نے یوں ستایا ہے تجھ کو مت نے یوں ستایا ہے مرگ محسن پہ بھی رلایا ہے تجھ کو بابا کے بعد امت نے ہائے دربار میں بولایا ہے یا زہرا یا زہرا یا زہرا یا زہرا یا زہرا یا زہرا تیری شبی بن کر کربلا میں تیری شبی بن کر اپنے بابا کی زندگی بن کر اپنے بابا کی زندگی بن کر تیرا بچ پر ہے سکینہ بی بی اور جوانی ہے زینب مزتر یا زہرا یا زہرا یا زہرا یا زہرا یا زہرا وقت آخر ہے بس میرا بی بی وقت آخر ہے بس میرا بی بی انگنت ہے میرے گناہ بی بی انگنت ہے میرے گناہ بی بی ہر واسطہ تجھ کو تیرے بچوں کا بخشوانا میرے گناہ بی بی یا زہرا یا زہرا یا زہرا یا زہرا یا زہرا یا حسین یا
السلام عليك يا رسول الله السلام عليك يا نبي الله السلام عليك يا محمد ابن عبد الله السلام عليك يا خاتم النبيين أشهد أنك قد بلغت رسالة وأقمت الصلاة وأتيت الزكاة وأمرت بالمعروف ونحيت عن المنكر وأبدت الله مخلصا حتى أتاك اليقين فصلوات الله عليك ورحمته وعلى أهل بيتك الطاهرين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وأشهد أنك رسول الله وأنك محمد محمد بن عبد الله وأشهد أنك قد بلغت رسالة ربك ونسحت لأمتك وجاهدت في سبيل الله وأبدت الله حتى أتاك اليقين بالحكمة والموئذة الحسنة وأديت الذي عليك من الحق وأنك قد رعفت بالمؤمنين وغلثت على الكافرين فبلغ الله بك أفضل شرف محل المكرمين الحمد لله الذي استنقذنا بك من الشرك والذلالة اللهم فاجأل سلواتك وسلوات ملائكتك المقربين وأنبيائك المرسلين وإبادك الصالحين وأهل السماوات والأرضين ومن سبه لك يا رب العالمين من الأولين والآخرين على محمد عبدك ورسولك ونبيك وأمينك ونجيك وحبيبك وسفيك وخستك وصفوتك وخيرتك من خلقك اللهم أعته الدرجة الرفيعة وآته الوسيلة من الجنة وابعثه مقاما محمودا يقبته به الأولون والآخرون اللهم إنك قلت ولو أنهم إذ ظلموا أنفسهم جاءوك فاستغفر الله واستغفر لهم الرسول لوجد الله توابا رحيما وأني أتيتك مستغفرا تعبا من ذنوبي وأني يتوجه بك إلى الله وربي وربك ليغفر لي ذنوبي السلام عليك يا أمير المؤمنين وابن سيد الوسيين السلام عليك يا فاطمة الزهراء سيرة نساء العالمين السلام عليك يا حسن المجتبى السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني جميعا سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر الأحد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين السلام عليكم يا شهداء كربلاء جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا غريب الغرباء ومعين الضعفاء والفكراء السلطان بالحسن مولانا علي بن موسى الرضا كن شفيعنا وشفيع والدينا في يوم الجزاء السلام عليك وعلى أختك فاطمة المعصومة ورحمة الله وبركاته 
السلام عليك يا حجة ابن الحسن يا مولانا يا صاحب الأصر والزمان سيدي الأمان 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 من فتن الزمان السلام عليك يا شريك القرآن السلام عليك يا كعبة الإيمان السلام عليك يا إمامنا وإمام الإنس والجان أجل الله تعالى فرجك وسحل الله مخرجك وزهورك ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن سلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقاعدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك توعا وتمتئه فيها تويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراهم صلوات الله محمد وآل محمد